And now a question for you again. What do you do for your self-care? As product managers and leaders, we can't forget that being great at what we do, being caring leaders for teams, paying attention to them, actually starts with us. Our next speaker has some valuable thoughts for you on that. Dominique Joost has held different leadership positions in his 20-year experience, both in engineering and product. He is now the head of product at Doist and is working to build a world-class, remote and async-first product organization. Ultimately, his goal is to build empowering environments where people can bring value both to the business and customers, all while having fun and, most importantly, staying sane. So come up on stage, Dominique Joost on Bulletproof Soul, Stress Management and Self-Care for Product Leaders. Test. I'm doing the testing. Oh, it works. All right, perfect. So, hi everyone. I'm super excited to be here and to talk about a topic that is near and dear to my heart. Uh, it's about self-care and stress management for product leaders, or how to create and maintain a bulletproof soul. Um, before I start, though, I have to say that I am not a medical professional in any uh, capacity. So, everything I'm going to share with you is based on my experience with um, burning out, being sidelined for months, spending a lot of money on therapy, coaching, books, uh, medication, and trying to understand like why other people do not um, understand the basics of stress management. So everything I'm going to share with you today is going to be what I think is the, a very simple way to get you started, a very simple way for you to implement some of these things. All right, so why is this such an important topic? Well, I'm guessing everybody in this room is a high achiever or at least has like high achiever uh, tendencies. So with high achievers, I'm looking at you, yes, front row. Um, you know, it's all about like getting to the next thing. The status quo is not good enough. There's always more to do. There's uh, titles to be had. There's more money to be made. And while that is good in some areas to push ourselves, you know, if you don't have a right strategy to counteract that need to be you know, more and push yourself, you might end up in a very bad situation. Right? And as leaders, whether you're an informal or a formal leader, you cannot take care of your team if you have no capacity uh, to take care of yourself. And as I said, I had to learn the hard way what it means if you have no strategy at all, or if you have no answers to those three questions that we heard this morning. And um, hopefully, you know, I can pass on a little bit of something for you to uh, take away after, after this talk. Um, just a little bit of theory to get us started. So if you think of a system, no matter how complex or simple it is, you always have like three basic components, right? You've got some form of input that gets put in a process that gets turned into some form of output. And if you think about stress management or stress, we have actually the same things, right? So your input are those external stressors, right? Things that you're exposed to, whether you want to or not. The process is your brain. And that means everybody's brain is unique, right? The way, it's, um, the way it works, the way you think, um, all of these things sort of take those inputs and then transform them into reactions. They could be physical reactions or mental reactions. And there's two things I would like you to take away from uh, this part. One is stress is not just one thing. It's a component of three things that interact with each other. That's number one. And number two, the brain is where things happen, right? So your brain, who you are, your values, um, um, you know, what you like, how your brain actually works, is what turns those signals into any form of reaction. Right, so those are the two things, after two minutes in, that I want, to take, uh, want you to take away with. All right, so there's three components to stress, and that means if you want to manage stress, you also need to tackle those three components individually. Right? And that is something that I didn't know um, at the very beginning, because my strategy was just to listen to what others said, right? Oh, you need to go you know, run more, or do this, or do that. But knowing that there's three components means that you need to um, 
to, to deal with your stressors, there's actually two ways you can do that. You either reduce your exposure to them or you eliminate uh, those stressors immediately if you have the power to do so. Um, and then in terms of your personal amplifiers, so the thing that transforms those signals into output, that's the hardest part actually to do, right? Because that takes a lot of soul searching and um, it sometimes also means changing um, your approach to certain things. It means uh, questioning your values. So that's like a lot of hard work, but that's where, that's where it's at. And then lastly, but not uh, least, but not last, um, to sort of combat the reactions, you need to find ways to recharge and relax, right? Like breathing techniques, like those kinds of things. All right. So this is a picture that you can take, right? So try and prevent your stressors, reflect on those personal amplifiers, and find ways to relax. Um, I'll, I'll share a link where you can download this, uh, everything, but yeah, still go ahead and take a picture. All right, so um, I'd like to share what happens or what could happen if you know none of this, right? So this is uh, my journey. So we have a bit of a thing with the journeys, right, uh, at the moment. Um, okay, so I was born in 1978. Um, to a, a Ghanaian mom and a Swiss father, grew up loving DC and Marvel. So I'm team Marvel, by the way, 100%. Um, loving comics, video games, computers, those kinds of things, and then found my way into um, software engineering. So this is a headshot of me. <laughs> yes, you may laugh, it's okay. Um, so I find my way into software engineering, and then somehow, a couple of years in, my manager said, hey, you want to be a team lead? I was like, oh, of course, you're right. more money, that, that makes sense. Um, so after doing that for a couple of years, uh, the question was, do you want to take over the software development uh, department? I was like, yeah, of course, you know, that kind of makes sense, way cooler than just leading a team. And then after a couple of years, I was like, mm, this kind of sucks because I'm a very bad engineer and um, I'm not excited about the same things like my engineering peers were excited about. So in 2012, like two cool things happened. One, I became a dad, so that's my son then, I guess, trying to decipher my spec. And um, I transitioned into, formally transitioned into product management, which was kind of, you know, sort of found my people, um, did that for a couple of years, being the head of mobile products when that still was a thing. And then I thought, you know what's cooler than being a head of mobile products? Actually being a product director, you know, that's way cooler. So uh, got a promotion, taking care of way more functions, product management, design, blah, 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 you know, all of these good things, uh, overseeing lots of different portfolios. Did that for a couple of years, and then I was like, you know what's cooler than being a product director? Being the CPO, right? <laughs> because that is, that's a shit right there, right? So uh, the opportunity arose, became a CPO, finally, you know, at the pinnacle of my career, earning a lot of money, being representing product at the seat with all the old white boys, you know, like doing all those things. And then everything sort of changed uh, in October uh, 2020. So I was, um, at that time I was kind of, you know, like super tired the whole time and I was um, gearing up for a presentation uh, for the uh, following week. So it was Friday, and then I just couldn't focus. And suddenly, um, I just got these massive headaches, right? And I think we've all had headaches, but it was just like, you know, it just didn't stop. So I canceled all my meetings and thought, you know, just sleep it off and do what CPOs do, which is resume work on Saturday and Sunday. Um, so I went to bed. Saturday came around, still had headaches. Uh, Sunday came around, headaches persisted. I was, uh, that's kind of weird, right? So I went to the doctor, and um, the first thing he asked me was, so what do you want to do? And I thought, well, I'm paying you, like you tell me, right? <laughs> uh, but I said, I need to unplug. Um, so I was put on sick leave for two weeks and I thought that was amazing, you know? Like the weights got lifted off my shoulders. I was like, oh, I finally get to watch Netflix, you know, just hang around, do nothing. That's just perfect. So the first week was actually pretty awesome. Um, and then the second week rolled around and I started to get anxious because I had a follow-up um, check-in with my doctor to determine what's going to happen next. And I also started to have doubts, right? Because what I knew from burnout and stress was you sort of, you know, you can't do anything. You can't get out of bed. You're sort of just almost in cap, in, what's it, like almost dead, right? Um, so I... I thought, you know, was I just trying to find a way out of that messy situation? Was I faking it? 
I also thought about my team who are now just struggling with the stuff that I left behind. So I was like, yeah, man, you know, I need to go back to work. Um, and then that Friday um, came around where I had to go to the uh, checkup again. And I was, I was alone at home, wife was at work, son at, at school. And, um, you know, I was just getting ready and I was watching the last episode of this amazing Netflix uh, show called The Queen's Gambit. Don't know whether a couple of you have seen it. Yeah. All right. Okay. Yes, yes. So for those who, who don't know this show, so it's about a chess prodigy that sort of defies all odds and rises to the top. Right. Um, so for those who've, you, who've seen it, you remember the last, um, the, 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 the finale, right, when she sort of beats the grand chess master and um, finally made it, makes it to the top and then sort of strolls out of the, of, the, um, of, of the building, you know, where she just won. And then she goes to this park and it's a beautiful scene, right? It's snowing and it's very, like the music is like very emotional and stuff like that. Um, so she walks through the park, like very content, like, yes, you know, finally made it. And then she walks by these old men playing chess. And one of them sort of recognizes her and then, you know, the second, the third, and they all just turn around. They call her name and they're like, oh, you know, just swarm her. And then I just started crying. And I'm not the kind of person who sort of is very emotional when it comes to movies, um, but I just cried. And it wasn't, you know, it wasn't like a sophisticated crying, right? <laughs> but it was like the kind of ugly cry that you do not want to ha have anybody see that, right? So I was just crying and I, was, I felt so lonely and so alone. And I was so shocked, I remember standing up, going to the bathroom and just checking whether I was really crying, just all these tears, you know, coming down my cheeks. And that's the moment I knew, like, something is, is sort of up, right? Um, so I sober up, I go to my um, doctor's appointment, and the moment he sees me, he goes, oh, you know, is everything okay? I'm like, no, you know, I'm not, I'm not feeling great. I'm just crying, and just halfway into his office. And then he puts me on a, a two-month sick leave, right, immediately. And then the moment I hear that, I'm just going, I'm crying even more because that's the moment I realize that I'm, I'm broken, you know, I need fixing. It's one thing to be away for two weeks, but then being away as, uh, um, as a CPO for two months, you know, that's a whole other thing. And, and you know, in the end, God, yeah, God put um, uh, on, on sick leave for two months, so I went back home, and then the first thing, obviously, was comms. What do, you, what do you tell employees about the CPO being away? And then also dealing with all these emotions about, you know, I failed, and um, I'm in a team of 10, 10 other executives, and I'm the only one who's sort of struggling with this. You know, I'm kind of, I don't belong there, and all of these things, you know, self-doubt, all of these things. Um, so I'm talking to the comms guy, and he's like, what should we say? And I said, I don't care, do whatever you want, but just do not use the word burnout, because in my head, burnout means you're weak, right? That's what it means. Um, so anyway, like looking back, 2020 was a very difficult year for many, many reasons. I think the main reason was that what sort of got me to the executive position didn't really matter anymore as an executive in that particular context, right? And it was almost as if it's playing a different game and nobody told me that the rules had changed. So I was like partially not very well equipped in going into that position. Although I had been at that point with the company for um, 14 plus years, right? So I started there as an engineer with 50 people, one location. I became a CPO. We were over 500 people, had multiple locations, multiple products. Um, like revenue X in, in those years. But the things were just, yeah, they were just different, right? And um, another factor was that the role that I took on two years ago morphed during those two years and needed something from me that I just wasn't able to give. You know, it was just going against my grain in terms of difficult people discussions, difficult discussions, uh, processes, product, and I just had no sense of self, no sense of you know, what I wanted, and it just derailed me completely. Um, yeah, so as I said, like you know, going through therapy, you know, sort of came back after a couple of months, part-time, but then also concluded that this is a perfect time to just do something else. And um, yeah, happy to say that 
2023, I don't wear a crown, but I wear flowers now. But I feel good, and um, all of these things that I'm sharing with you today are sort of helping me to stay sane. And I do have like ups and downs still, you know, it's a, it's a journey, but at least I feel like I'm in control and I have some tools that can help me during difficult situations. All right, part three. Um, so I knew that I wasn't the only one struggling, right? Um, so I was trying to find resources online, and back then there wasn't a lot of people talking about this, so I sort of reached out to my network and asked different product leaders and product thought leaders like how they um, were dealing with this situation. So I you know, was super lucky to talk to, like, I think, over 50 different people who went from you know, working in, in uh, companies that you've never heard of, from working in companies that... Um, build the most popular th app that we just saw on Slido to uh, writing books that you've all read and ask them two questions. The first one was, how do you recognize critical stress levels? And then the follow-up question was, well, how do you then sort of deal with those um, things that you've recognized? And here's what they, they told me. Okay, number one, remember the stressors, so the signals, the input. Um, these are sort of the groups of things that they mentioned, but by far, like, over 50% bucketed stuff into just having way too much work, right? That's like the number one thing you're exposed to, just having way too much work, then dealing with lots of emotional topics, and then also dealing with topics that you're just not feeling, right? It's just, yeah, it's just not doing anything for you. And then prevention uh, tactics that they mentioned was relying on a support network, focusing on high leverage work, uh, performing like self check-ins, and not just managing their time, but also managing their energy. Then moving on to those personal amplifiers, I would say like the first part is sort of, yeah, you know, yeah, that sort of makes sense. But the second part where, um, you know, I said that your brain turns those stressors into reactions, that's what surprised me the most. So here, like 80% talked about self-doubt, having a unhealthy relationship with work, and just having this inner drive to constantly prove yourself. And that third point was especially, um, the more you are a minority, the more this sort of skyrockets to the top, right? And then also just being way too nice. And in terms of tactics, you know, uh, we heard from Tommy, you need to have answers to those three questions. So that's the number one thing, like what do you really want, right? Because that is the North Star that you will use to judge whether um, you want to remove yourself from certain situations or not. Then ha again, having self-check-ins, um, finding a way to put your work into perspective, into the right balance, and then finding a way also to just be nice to yourself, right? Uh, and then the third part was about the uh, kinds of physical and emotional reactions here, like 50-ish percent, uh, the first, number one thing was just being short with friends, families, coworkers, um, feeling physical pain, you know, your back, your neck, like all of these things, your head, uh, the impact that it has on your clear ability to clearly think, and then eventually the ability it has on the quality of work that you can produce. And then sort of mitigation tactics were like, you know, do some form of physical activity. Um, take breaks, find your form of meditation, which is, a, which is just a way of saying, find a way to listen to yourself, right? Whether it's formal meditation or just going uh, swimming or whatever um, sort of works for you. And then again, like finding ways to just do, you know, do, do well, by, uh, do good to yourself. Um, so as I was thinking about these things, I think it would be interesting to sort of reflect on um, before my burnout, how I would have filled out that canvas, and it would have looked something like this, right? You can see the top is just like question mark, question mark, like no clue. My only um, stress management tactics was like, go for a run, right? But as we know, stress is composed into three di different parts. So whilst you're going for a run, might be good for your physical reactions, it does nothing for, for the rest. And you can also see at the bottom, um, you know, I would say like self-awareness was barely scratched the minimal threshold. Um, filling out this canvas now would look something like this. Um, and it's not about like reading all the bullet points, but the fact is that you know, 
you need to understand yourself like very well, especially in that middle column, because that is the thing that will then um, help you, you know, manage stress and um, focus on self-care. All right. So I definitely urge you to fill out that canvas. I'll share a link and then you can do that. But filling out that canvas is something that we product people love to do, right? Frameworks, canvases, da 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 da, all of those things. But then we never do shit with it, right? <laughs> so there's one, there's one part that is super critical, which is tied to transformation, right? So because everything is sort of like a mini transformation if you're looking at that middle column of uh, your personal amplifiers. And there's been so many great books written about transformation, like Switch from the Heat Brothers, like they have their framework of riders, elephants, paths. We know this book, right? Triggers, actions, rewards. Uh, James Clear, like all men write books like this. I don't know what's going on. Um, and then the, I think all of these frameworks are great. The framework that resonated most with me was this 4DX framework uh, introduced in uh, the book Deep Work by Carl Newport. And he basically says that this is the framework you need to have in place to get anything done, right? So you need to focus on something that's super important, which I think we can agree that stress management and self-care is super important. Yeah, you sure? Yeah, sort of, okay. Um, and then being able to act on leading indicators. Now, if you visualize that canvas, everything on the left is a leading indicator, right? Once your body reacts to stress, that's, that's way too late. So you need a way to identify those leading indicators, have a scorecard, which the canvas can sort of provide. But what's missing is this cadence of accountability, right? So that's what we're going to do. So everybody, like, pull out your phones officially. Like, I'm going to give you some homework. Um, because we're going to, I'm going to give you three steps in addition to that canvas on how you can create that um, a baseline accountability. All right, number one. You need to think of, you need to find three to five people who you truly trust. Like a good litmus test is who would you call in the middle of the night if you need help? If your answer is zero, then yeah, you need to, you can put my name, I'll share my email with you and then you can, you can email me if you have any issues. All right, that's the first thing, right? And then the second thing is you need a weekly cadence of just personal reflection. 15 minutes, make it a habit, same day, same time. Doesn't need to be something super fancy. You don't need like a formal agenda. Although I would recommend that you take that canvas and just reflect on your week, right? Look at the stressors. Did you encounter any of those? How did you react, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and then the last part is you need a monthly recurring task um, to connect with person X. And that person X is one of those people that you listed in the first step. And why is that important? So in the weekly personal um, cadence, you can bullshit yourself all you want, right? Oh, everything is good, uh, stress level, uh-uh-uh. But you need that external per um, person who can call you out on your BS, and that's what this is for, right? Because if you have a true friend, they will tell you that this is not going well, you know, you need to check in with yourself. So you need to have those, those uh, different viewpoints. And you can do like a walk and talk or, you know, whatever, whatever you want to do with that. And we're almost at the end. There's one last thing. There's always one last thing, which is uh, this very famous person <laughs> who I also interviewed, um, one of the 50 product leaders, uh, had like the most beautiful uh, summary of all of that. Um, she said that there's three things, you know, you need to... Um, look out for. First of all, you need to, well, make sure you are taking breaks, you know, that sort of uh, makes sense. And then also the solid support network, because in all these different situations, you will be relying on people to help you out, to uh, call you out, and without that su support network, it's going to be like super, super difficult. So that's another picture you can take, because if in your weekly personal reflection, you're like, nah, canvases, uh, you know, I'm, I'm here with all of that uh, frameworks and canvas nonsense. Just ask yourself whether you have these three things in place. I think that's a great start um, in your weekly personal reflection. And there's more stuff. Um, like during my entire recovery, there's just so much I learned about myself um, as a product leader. And there's a couple of books that help me also build a leadership style that fit my personality 
rather than thinking I had to be a certain way, which was also one of the issues that I had um, as being a CPO, because you come into an established group and you see everyone like behave in a certain way and you want to fit in. So, you know, if you don't have a clear sense of value and self, you just sort of go with the crowd and do whatever. Um, so, um, uh, there's the, the links to these resources are also on the homepage, which I'll share right after this. Um, there's resources about if you're not, if you don't want to go to therapy, there's a great book about how you can be your own therapist, which has very practical step-by-step um, -step guidance to sort of manage yourself. Uh, fear is also a very important um, aspect, you know, knowing when and how you fear and why that comes, uh, comes up in certain situations. So all of these things are just worthwhile for you to uh, check out. So that's it. Uh, I hope I was able to give you a couple of uh, things that you can take along. Uh, you do have homework, right? So please, please, if this is something that is, um, sort of resonates with you, just have those check-ins, forget the canvas, forget all of that stuff, just start with the check-ins and then go from there. Right, so thanks and um, I'll say congrats on becoming one step closer or getting one step closer to becoming a bulletproof soul. You're awesome and this is where you can find more. Uh, if you want to bring this to your teams or get in, in contact uh, with me, just hit me up. So thank you very much and enjoy the rest of the conference. <laughs>